Hey guys, uh, Fru here. Welcome to the channel. Uh, in today's presentation, we're going to talk about a concept that is uh, all too familiar in uh, the ML space. Uh, and this is the whole idea of auto ML versus uh, ML ops. If you've uh, worked with uh, machine learning at all, or if you're curious about machine learning, AI, uh, sooner or later, you're going to hear somebody say auto ML and someone is going to say ML ops. Now, what exactly is the difference between these two? It's kind of an interesting uh, thing to think about. They all sound familiar. They both have ML, and uh, but there are differences. There are differences between the two of them. So what I'm going to do in this video today is call out the differences using a really fascinating analogy. Uh, I'm going to call out some tools that are relevant in this space uh, so you can think about them. And uh, out of this, you would uh, fully, fully, hopefully understand the difference between uh, auto ML and uh, ML ops on the right side. So let's go into the analogy that we have today, auto ML versus ML ops. Now, the, the analogy I'm going to use uh, to bring this home is to uh, use something that we might be very familiar with, uh, a pancake. So if you think about a, a pancake, the whole idea of making a pancake involves a lot of things. And we're going to start here from the left side of the screen. So uh, let's say you want to bake your favorite pancake, starting from the left side, you might need some ingredients. So we might need some salt, we might need some flour, we might need some yeast, water, and a lot of ingredients can go into uh, resulting in a pancake on the right side. Now, assume you've never baked a pancake before and all you have is a recipe. So you have a bunch of recipes, well, not recipes, all you have are ingredients. Let me, let me put it that way. All you have are ingredients. And then, and that's on your left side. And on your right side, you have your taste preference, right? What you like, what kind of pancake you like. Do you want a soft pancake, a hard pancake, uh, a, a, you know, a sweet pancake, a salty pancake? What is it you like? What are your preferences? So the process of making that pancake evolves, uh, involves uh, creating a recipe. And that recipe is a combination of the different types of ingredients in different proportions. So you might say, well, I want, you know, uh, two salt, three flour, uh, three yeast, and five water, right? It, it, that doesn't really make much sense. But just imagine the, the, the quantity of that. So let's say two uh, tablespoons of salt, three bags of flour, you know, uh, three ounces of yeast, and maybe five gallons of water, right? Um, and that's going to be a recipe. And that could be one recipe. And there could be many, 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 many different recipes that you have uh, to try to create your pancake here on the right side. So if you imagine going into the kitchen, you try, you know, two, three, three, five, and see what kind of pancake uh, comes out. Maybe you don't like that. And then you come and say, okay, let's try five, six, uh, seven, one and you see what kind of pancake comes out and maybe you don't like that and you go you try uh you experiment uh, a, a different combination of these recipes or the, a different combination of these ingredients to create a new recipe and you keep trying all right and so all the while you are carrying out experiment and you're trying and in the ideal world if you carry out those experiments and you're trying to figure out what pancake would be good for you you want to keep track of this of the combinations that you, you're trying because otherwise you wouldn't know what is working and what is not working right for the ones that are working maybe you double down of them on them if you're keeping track and for the ones that don't work you want to absolutely avoid it right so maybe you realize that if salt is ever greater than five everything else falls apart right so you then know your limit of salt is five and then you can keep uh trying the other uh pieces the other ingredient in in your recipe uh, in your in, on your ingredient list to build a recipe uh, for uh, for pancakes. So now you might have an experiment tracker, right? So let's call this an experiment uh, tracker. You can keep a list. You can keep a logbook. So each time you try a, a, a combination of ingredients, you see what comes out, the pancake that comes out, and you write that in your experiment tracker, and you say, was it good or was it not good? If it's not good, you repeat. And eventually, this whole exercise of going from ingredients, uh, experimentation, getting a pancake, bringing feedback back is going to hopefully give you a pancake that you can eat or that you can enjoy. Now, 
imagine that somebody comes to you and tell you, oh, instead of you having to manually put in a bit of salt, put in a bit of flour, a bit of yeast, a bit of water to get a pancake, I have these machines, I call it auto pancakes, where just give me the ingredients that you have into auto pancakes and auto pancake is going to just try combinations of those ingredients. It's going to keep trying. It's going to iterate and try combinations of those ingredients and it's going to bounce the result against what your test preference is uh, automatically until it figures out what that combination is for you and it's going to give you the recipe right off the, off the bat. So instead of you manually trying salt and trying flour, trying heat, water, sugar, right? You just give all your ingredients to auto pancake. Auto pancake takes that. It just iterates through and it goes through a combination, combinations of, of, of those ingredients. And it tries that out. And eventually, once it hits that sweet spot of the pancake, based on what you prefer as your, your preferred pancake, then auto, uh, auto pancakes is going to tell you, all right, good. Here's your recipe. It spits out the recipe. And even more interesting, auto pancake automatically keep track of all those experiments for you. So if you wanted to go back and see what auto pancakes did, you can go into the experiment history from auto pancake and you would see exactly all the combinations that it tried, the ones that failed and the ones that succeeded. And that's the one, the recipe that's going to give to you. So that's auto pancake for us. All right. Now, this is interesting. This is an interesting concept to think about from an auto pancake perspective. Now, you can see where we're going. Imagine you don't want to have just auto pancakes, right? You don't want to just create pancakes. But what you really want is to run a pancake restaurant. You want to run a pancake restaurant. So what you need is not just the pancake, but there's a whole lot. There's a whole lot of stuff that goes into running a pancake restaurant, right? So let's look at that. So in a pancake restaurant, okay, it's great. You have a great pancake. It tastes good. You think it's going to be amazing. But now you want to run a restaurant, all right? So let's call this restaurant, this restaurant Pancake Ops. So our restaurant is going to be Pancake Ops. Now, what does Pancake Ops involve? It involves getting a kitchen with the right tools, an oven, and everything that it needs. Uh, hiring a bunch of waiters uh, to staff the restaurant, take orders, and sit people on the table. So now you need to get a table, you need to get space, and you need to set all that up with decor and everything. Now you have to figure out how to get payments and collect payments uh, in your restaurant. Once customers come in, they order uh, from the kitchen. The waiter is going to take that, go run the payments and collect funds. Now you're going to buy dishes for serving the pancakes. You're going to take orders, of course, running that through the payment. And then you're going to bring the orders to the kitchen. The cooks are going to cook that order uh, and bake the pancake based on the recipe that you, you got from above. So they're going to apply that recipe and, and bake the pancake. And then, of course, you are a very smart uh, restaurateur or a restaurant operator. And you, you figure out that, yeah, maybe this pancake works in this season, in the summer season. But you always want to survey your customers to say, hey, what do you guys think about this pancake? Is this still working? Is this still not working? Maybe foreigners are coming to your restaurant and you're trying to get input to say, hey, how is this pancake uh, behaving or how do these foreigners like my pancake or how do people from out of state like my pancake or how do people from different cities like my pancake or you might say well when we created the pancake we, we tested it with uh when i tested it with my friends well my friends are older people but in my restaurant i'm seeing a lot of children coming into the restaurant do children like this pancake or do they like a different type of pancake so you're surveying and you're taking that input back to the kitchen to redo your recipe right and you create your recipe and the cycle repeats so it's an iterative process for this for this pancake ops of baking the pancake delivering the pancake uh serving the pancake taking payment getting feedback iterating through that feedback updating your recipes and then repeating that all these nine years so what we can see here is that pancake ops it's a bigger requirement than auto pancakes. So auto pancakes can give us the recipe, but it falls as a piece. It's just a piece, right? So auto pancakes can maybe be a piece of pancake ops, right? So auto pancake will give us a good recipe. And this is not a trivia task. We've seen up here, it's, it's a lot of work. It's a very specialized work, right? You might need to hire some data scientists, not data scientists, some pancake scientists or some food scientists to give you this, this recipe with auto pancakes. 
But once you have that, there's a lot of operation around that to make pancake ops uh, possible. So this is the analogy that we have to talk about auto pancakes and pancake ops. Now, how does this relate to the topic at hand, auto ML and ML ops? And hopefully, hopefully we're getting the point here. So let's take a look at what auto ML would entail and what ML ops would entail. So here for auto ML, the example we're going to give is uh, an organization that has some customers. And as part of that, so these are customers for the organization. It's a banking organization. And on the right side, they want to uh, approve or deny loan applications for those customers. So it's a bank. You have to, you have a lot of money. You want to, uh, people are coming in. They want to take a loan. You need to look at certain criteria, look at information about them, their income, um, their credit history, and a lot of information to then say, hey, I'm going to approve this loan or not. All right, so let's come in what is involved with that. So what we need for this is we're gonna to have to build an, an ML for, for this. So we wanna build a machine learning model to predict the loan. So what do we need? We need to get data. So what kind of data do we need? We need to understand uh, their, 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 their credit history, their work history, their, sal their salary, uh, would they pay on time? And all that information, we need to gather that information. We need to explore the information. So do some data exploration. We need to do some feature engineering. We need to figure out what features or what criteria are relevant for predicting if a customer will pay the loan back or not. And so this is a lot of feature engineering that goes in here, one hot encoding, cleaning of that data and, and storing that in the feature store. So a lot of work goes in here to make this feature engineering happen. Then you have to decide to build your model, right? You might say, I'm gonna use a decision tree. I'm gonna use uh, XGBoost. I'm gonna use uh, you know, deep uh, neural network or, or CNN. So whatever it is, you can use a bunch of uh, models here to figure out which model will be the best, right? And once you have the model, you can go ahead to do parameter, right? Or let's even call this hyperparameter. So hyperparameter tuning, you have to hyper do your hyperparameter tuning to say, hey, if I look at income and, and credit score, it predicts loan more than something else, right? And so this whole exercise of going through and figuring out what piece of this puzzle is relevant to predicting the loan application is the auto ML. So the auto ML is gonna iterate through and take your data points and say, Let's try this one. Let's try this model. Let's try this data. Let's use a different combinations. Let's look at the hyperparameter. Which hyperparameter is, is relevant? Uh, what learning rate is, is relevant? And it's just going to go through a lot of that groundwork. And then eventually you have a model that can predict if a customer should be given loan or not. And there's a whole lot more that goes into this. You have to think about, you know, biases in the model maybe on the source side the data coming in is not correct you have to clean up that data and do a lot of work to uh, get the data in the format that you want right maybe data is coming in as a uh, text but you want to train your model with videos you somehow need to take the text to video and i'm just kind of going on the left field here but you, you get the point that a lot of work goes into this whole uh idea of uh trying to get the model the machine learning model to predict your customer. So this is auto ML. So tools in this space that would do auto ML, you will hear about like auto Keras and, and, and uh, my screen is just canceling here on me, bear with me. Um, I think this is sky, sky learn from sky kit. So sky learn, uh, data robot, auto waker, uh, there's MF flow, uh, there's cube flow as well. My screen just canceled on me. There is uh, cube flow. There are a lot of, or tools as well as projects that are helping in this space, right? So you can automatically say, okay, these are my these are my ingredients. So you on the left side you give your ingredients, and on the right side you tell what you expect, and then AutoML does that work in between to figure out what combinations of input would meet the output that you want, and it, it iterates through that. So again, AutoCuras. Data Robot, Data IQ, you know, Auto Waker. There are a lot of companies that are playing in this space to help with auto, um, uh, auto ML. Now, how does that differ from ML Ops? Now, 
like we, we talked about this before, ML ops is uh, auto ML is a subset of ML ops, it, uh, as we can see. So here from an ML ops perspective, we assume that we have a nice machine learning model from above. Now, how do we take that and operationalize it? That's where the ops comes in. And this borrows from uh, data engineering and, and, and actually applications development where we had uh, DevOps and data ops. And now we're seeing the whole uh, idea of uh, uh, ML ops and AI ops. So what this involves is how do we effectively gather our requirements, maybe go through a sprint if that's what you do uh, from, a, from an agile perspective. Uh, from there, we want to go ahead and do our development. So uh, this is development. So we do our development. We run through our QA and UAT. Uh, we deploy that to production. Uh, we run our models in production and, and operationalize that in prod. Uh, we look at new scenarios. And as new scenarios come in, we go back and we update our model. Uh, because, you know, new scenarios might challenge our model, very similar to what we had above here, where uh, new demographics or new people coming in can look at the pancake and say, hey, I, I prefer a different pancake, not what you had before. And so we always have to get that feedback to update our pancakes, right? That's the survey there. So in here, uh, as we see new scenarios in production, we have to go back and update the machine learning model because machine learning models are never static. And once we update the model, we, we just iterate back again, right? Um, and this is what we need to do from an ops perspective. But how do we operationalize this, automate this, and make this very seamless? And that's where uh, ML ops practice comes into play. You know, ML ops is not necessarily a tool, but it's a paradigm. It's a mindset. It's a way of doing things that is simple. And it borrows from the DevOps and the data ops uh, legacy. All right, so that's what we have for ML ops. Now, um, what are some of the challenges that ML ops would solve? One of the big challenges is going from is going from QA all the way to deployment. Because if you have an amazing model that you've developed and you and you're doing that development in QA, how do you hand that model to the folks, the IT folks uh, that would be running that model in production and in embedding that into the production applications? Uh, and then how do we get the feedback and retrain the model here as we get new scenarios. A good example I, I like to share here is think about, um, and, and a lot of folks will be familiar with this, self-driving cars. Tesla as an example. They have a lot of sensors on the, car, on, on the cars, right? So the cars are on the road. They have some self-driving, you know, to some extent, some self-driving technology. But guess what? Those cars were trained on data sets. Now, if you take a Tesla and you, you know, remove it from San Francisco and you bring it to Mumbai, well, the Tesla is not familiar with the road in Mumbai. So at that point, it's executing in Mumbai, but the roads might be different, the structures might be different, the crosswalks might be different. And so it needs to get new data using the cameras or the, all the sensors that it has and bring those, those new scenarios, those edge cases, those new cases to update uh, the Tesla and it gets better. That's why people say, oh, Tesla cars are getting better with more data as it collects and runs in production. That's basically what it is. And, you know, teams like Tesla are good because they've automated a lot of this. They have good pipelines that go from new scenarios to updating the models and deploying those models in production and then bringing it all back. So it's not enough to just have an amazing model from above, but how do you operationalize all of this? That's where ML Ops comes into play. All right, like I said, it borrows on CI, CD, and DevOps, and some of the tools in ML Ops that you might see or hear about would be like Git, Jenkins, DBT, right? Git is for managing code, Jenkins um, for orchestration and, and deployment, DBT is for actually building. If you need that, uh, you might need a feature store, you might need uh, basic documentation, you might need uh, a place for for storing your your uh, your metadata, the experiments that you've run, a place, a way of collecting feedback from your users, uh, a way of sending those fe those feedbacks to the development team so the models can be can be updated, and you want to automate all of that, and so that's really what ML Ops uh, is about, right? So just to go back and, and to summarize with the example that we've 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 looked at, ML Ops versus 
uh, uh, auto ML. Auto ML will help you automate the process of building a machine learning model. You might want a machine learning model to predict uh, customer applications for a bank. There are many options out there. There is, uh, you know, decision trees, uh, lo logistic models. You can use something like XGBoost. You can use um, deep neural networks. So many options there. Lightboost. There are just so many options out there. Which one of those options would work for your applications? ML Ops will help you with that. Now, once ML Ops has, has succeeded in getting a good model, and maybe the result from there is, all right, for this, we're going to use X, uh, XGBoost. We're going to use this particular hyperparameter. We're going to use this particular data set. This is the feature we're going to use. We're going to uh, one hot encode them this way, and that's going to be your model, right? You can document that, and you can save that in into your experiment tracker server. Now, once you have that, then the other processes of taking that to production, deploying it, uh, testing it, getting feedback, updating your model, operationalizing all of that is ML Ops. And there are tools, there are processes that helps with that. It's not a specific technology. It's not a specific company. It's just a mindset of, of operationalizing it. Just like the way DevOps is not a tool. There's no tool called DevOps. DevOps is a way you operate, right? So ML Ops is a way you operate. Now, there might be specific tools to help with auto ML, like auto Keras, Skylearn, Data Robot, AutoWaker, so many of them, right? MLflow, uh, Kubeflow, there are just so many out there. Uh, there might be specific tools, but when it comes to ML Ops, it's more of a mindset of a paradigm. All right, guys. So there you have it. Hopefully, this helps uh, you understand the difference between ML Ops. It's such a big topic these days. We're seeing a lot of ops. You know, companies are talking about everything ops. So uh, Auto ML plays a, a very important role. ML Ops plays a very, a very important role to me. This is a subset of this, right? So you can have your auto ML and then the uh, ML ops will be uh, encompassing the results of auto ML and then operationalizing that. All right. So hopefully this was helpful. As always, if you like this, make sure you like it. If you did not like it, please do not like it. That's okay. Um, uh, share this with somebody that might get value out of it. If you have any questions, any topics you want through to make a video about, to explain it, to break it down, don't hesitate to let me know in the comment section below and I'll see what I can do. Again, thanks for watching. This has been through. You've been awesome. I'll see you in our next presentation.